right, so welcome back to Multifamily Live. Super excited for today's show. We have Van Sturgeon on the show. Hey, Van, how you doing? I'm doing very well, Jason. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, to jibber jabbering with you. Hopefully, yeah. provide some content for all for all your listeners out there. These multifamilyers that are running around looking for property, but it's awfully difficult nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. And so we're excited to dive in there. Let me give them a quick rundown of you and everything you're doing. So Van's an experienced entrepreneur of over 30 years, He's successfully created several businesses in the real estate industry that covers areas of land acquisition, development, management, construction, and renovation. Van personally owns over a thousand properties across North America, is semi-retired. Uh, I, th- I think we all get to that point of semi-retired, right? From the day-to-day operations of his business, passionate in helping homeowners and real estate investors overcome their fears of house renovations, rehabbings, and loves to be actively involved in helping other people reach their goals. So Dan, that's awesome, man. And so, yeah, really excited to dive in here. You know, a thousand properties that that takes effort, right? So, so that doesn't just show up and you say, okay, next week, oh, here's my goal, right? So talk us through just the evolution. From, from where you, you, you found that first property, got you out of the gate, or maybe it was multiple properties, to how you've scaled yourself to this part of today. Sure. Uh, well, I, I'm, uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, and uh, I came from a, a background, and I kind of fell into uh, real estate investing, multifamily space, and that uh, my immigrant parents, uh, instead of buying their dream home, they, for, they, purchased their, they purchased the apartment building that they were actually uh, renting an apartment from. Wow. And uh, uh, it was uh, it was in the late seventies, and, and they bought this beautiful little building. And instead of buying their dream home, they bought this bought this apartment building. And um, unfortunately, things kind of took a train a turn for the worse during that period of time because of the you know the seventies. Uh, you're too young to remember, but their inflation was sky high at eighteen something percent, and interest rates were the same thing too. And unemployment was was crazy. It, it was just a bad it was a bad period of time. And this apartment building that was fully occupied uh, in Chicago there, all of a sudden, the neighborhood started to deteriorate. And all of a sudden, we were experiencing a high vacancy rate uh, from 40, 50, 60%. I, I can remember walking through the building, half of it was vacant. And it was uh, we, were, we weren't the only ones experiencing that. Other landlords in the area were as well. It was just a, uh, all the you know, crime, violence, all that kind of stuff uh, crept in. And landlords were forced to, some of them were actually torturing their buildings to collect insurance money. It got that bad. And so during that period of time, um, we had to, as a family, sort of buckle down and try to do, we did everything that ourselves, whether it's you know, managing it ourselves, uh, uh, painting, plastering, roof repair, anything that, everything that we could have, uh, replaced electrical work, we did, all, we did all ourselves. And it was from that background that I was exposed to you know, the renovation construction side, real estate investing. And uh, we were able to get through that period of time. And it was it was a great investment that my parents had made. And ultimately, I got involved when I, I went off to university, graduated. Um, I disappointed my parents. They wanted, were hoping that I was going to become one of these lawyers or something like that. And mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't, couldn't see myself doing that. And uh, I got involved. I got into general contracting. I was a general contractor. So I got started in the late 80s, early 90s, and luckily it was a uh, it was a good period of time. And I, as I began to develop my business, uh, creating relationships, so I kept running into these real estate investors who were, you know, acquiring properties to flip or were acquiring properties to create a portfolio. And that's when I got started uh, in I in that uh, in doing that on the along with developing my general contracting business. I started dabbling in real estate investing, so I started flipping houses. And then that thing led to uh, creating a portfolio. And along the way, I never planned this out when it got started. But along the way, there were certain synergies that were created from, from being in that, in that industry. So f- from being a general contractor, I moved into building homes. From there, uh, I started creating a, a portfolio, which then all of a sudden uh, I created mass that I developed a property management company. And then from there, because of the relationships I had with other real estate investors, I would manage their portfolios, and then that fed into uh, doing restoration work on on properties as well. So heavy intensive stuff like uh, you know balcony repair, underground garage repair, those really huge capital improvements. Um, so I, I've been very blessed, and it's been a hell of a roller coaster ride along the way. But uh, I got to a point in my life where, I, as you mentioned, my in bio, like I got to a point where I'm 
semi retired right now. And I've got really great people that I've, uh, that I put in place and also created uh, partnerships with, uh, with a number of individuals. And as a result, I'm, or more in a, I'm sort of in that, uh, you know, I've taken a, so opportunity to just kind of stop and smell the flowers as we go along the, you know, toward the twilight years of my, uh, you know, of life. So that's where I'm at right now. And I really, I really enjoy getting out there and having conversations with you and others uh, to be able to get out that good word and, you know, go probably hopefully provide the level of wisdom and experience that I've been able to accumulate over the last 30 years. I've literally done thousands of renovations, rehabs on anything from single family home apartments to big 22 story you know, office or apartment building. So hmm. these are the types of things that have developed over a period of time. Unfortunately, these experiences, you can't pour into a book. It's practical things that you've developed. This is sixth sense, your eyes behind your back, you know, you're behind your head that you kind of, when you walk into a property, there's a, your ability to be able to quickly assess the situation. And those are the types of things that I'm trying to help out with, with investors and syndicators that are out there in the marketplace right now, trying to get into the, trying to get into this wonderful game. You know, it's one of those key points here is that so many times you want to know everything before you get started, but you don't know the questions to ask to get yourself the answers. And you have to take that step, take that leap, right, to figure out the question, right? Because as soon as you you waste all this time trying to, you know, read through every book, and they, 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 of course, have their value. However, then you get out and the first day, you get smacked in the face and you say, whoa, why I would have never, never knew that if I, if I actually just didn't go out. I can think of a hundred instances myself for people who are listening that, that haven't been exposed to, you know, inflation is coming on high interest rates you know, in above 10%, right? Most of us have never seen that in our lifetime where today we're three, 4%. If you see a 4% loan on some of these commercial properties, like, man, that's high, right? How, how are you looking at things today? Um, noting what you've seen in the past, how, how do you view going forward with what's happening in today's economic climate? It is a, it's a very interesting time and uh, it's a volatile time. It's something that it's a, it's a period of time that we're going through that is unprecedented and there will be opportunities and also a minefield that you'll have to navigate through. Um, I, I Obviously, through the 30 years uh, of doing this, there have been periods of time that we've had uh, outside forces that have created, uh, that have created, uh, you know, uh, situations where 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 we we had to readjust and there were opportunities that presented, presented themselves and unfortunately some people got caught uh, holding the bag uh, unfortunately and so moving forward to answer your question I, I I always revert I've been the reason why I've been successful is that I've always uh, been able to buy properly and I often find that lots of folks out there in whether it's in a single family home space or multifamily are really buying deals that are awfully skinny. And one wrong move in terms of interest rates moving in the wrong direction, and, and, if that, and it looks as though that's going to be the case, and ultimately what's that going to do to cap rates? And what is that going to do to the overall real estate market moving forward if you have that inflation? Uh, there's also, you know, there's certain areas where uh, rents are increasing and they're not, they're increasing at such a rate that they're not being reflective in also uh, the vast, the values of uh, properties that are, that are currently going up for sale also. So there's a number of different factors out there. And I don't claim to have a crystal ball to be able to identify one direction or another. I will still say that I constantly, uh, whatever uh, opportunities are presenting themselves, we're going through them uh, and making sure that we're purchasing them, uh, purchasing very well. Um, you know, to use sort of an adage, uh, you know, like the it's like the, the ARV. If we're looking at an ARV, it would be you know we're looking at 60, 70 percent of that ARV, and that's the kind of purchase that we're looking at. Um, so, in, uh, fortunately, in this overheated real estate market, I'm re we're relying more on the relationships. So we always have relied on the relationships we've developed in the areas that we focused on, and in those areas, uh, not to say that opportunities are plentiful, but they're still ex they still exist. We don't. I, 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 we don't, they're all based on off market deals. They're not anything associated with, you know, things that you'll find on good all MLS. Um, these are relationships that have been developed over a period of time. Relationships, for example, with property managers, with per, uh, real estate uh, agents who have off market, you know, have pocket listings. Um, we've got relationships with wholesalers as well. Those are the types of opportunities that I often find 
uh, new real estate investors don't have, and they immediately rush over to that MLS to start looking for, or or or, or what's that other one, LoopNet, and there there are no opportunities where millions of people have eyes, you know, poke, copy, you know combing through these opportunities. There there are no. So that's where we've been able to navigate through the, you know, through over the course of 30 years is just identifying great deal. You know, the property managers is such a key piece to having access to deals, right? They're, they're right in the face of it. They know if an owner's just underwater or undercapitalized or having a partnership dispute. And so many times that's been just such a great lead, right? Because uh, it is it is a really unforgiving business, right? You do great, the owner sells the property, you do bad, you get fired. And it's kind of, it's hard to be a, a property manager, right? It's a, it's a difficult state to be in. But in that same part, if something happens on the ownership side, you know, that property manager it would make more sense to be able to align partnerships, align a buyer and a seller and keep that portfolio in-house, right? So it's definitely something, making those relationships with good property managers really just, just counts out. Looking at commercial properties today, so we talked you know, a little bit on the ARV for, for that, you know, talking about the, the inflation driving of rental rates. How are you looking at commercial properties or really multifamily properties today compared to what you've potentially done in the past? Has anything changed or is it just still sticking to your core principles? No, I'm, I was just saying to uh, the, the uh, core principles, uh, we have identified areas, four areas that we uh, we are actively looking for opportunities. Um they, within every market, there are uh, there are niches, there are sub markets that uh, appreciate or are better than others. Every market does. Whether you, know, you look at a Chicago, Detroit, uh, Miami, there are areas that you should avoid, and there's areas that you should be gobbling opportunities. And so, uh, it's you got to be you got to do a lot of due diligence. You got to ultimately you have to create that power team in each of one of these areas that you're focused on. And the, those relationships are incredibly important uh, because of the opportunities that they present themselves to you. Like, as I mentioned, like you touched on property managers are really a, a, one of my, our lifelines or lifebloods in terms of, of generating opportunities and leads moving forward. Um, so that, that's one. And there's other opportunities, relationships you need to create in those marketplaces, which will give you, it will expose you to these opportunities. And uh, and ultimately, that's what I pro- I'm a huge proponent on for investors that are trying to get in to real estate investing. And that's and it's whether that's on single family side or even on the multifamily side as well. So if you're looking, building your power team, going into a market, you know, what kind of areas should investors be focusing on when they're going into a new market? And besides, of course, the broker and the property manager, who are some of those other pieces of the power team? Uh, to answer your first the first part of your question, I think that there's two types of investments that folks uh, ultimately will make. One is based on cash flow. The other one is based on appreciation. Uh, I would recommend uh, uh, new real estate investors coming in, again, whether it's in single family or multifamily, that they concentrate their efforts on, a, on opportunities that generate positive cash flow. And once you've created a portfolio of those types of properties, you're generating on a consistent mm-hmm. basis cash flow. Then we get, then we sort of move off into a properties that are more based on appreciation, where you might acquire property at a lower cap rate or uh, lower rates of return, but your expect your anticipation is that on the appreciation side, you're going to see some dramatic uh, movement in a positive direction. Um, cash flow. I, I look at cash flow uh, properties on cash flows to pay you know, to create that lifestyle. And then the other properties, the properties that appreciate in those areas that appreciate appreciate dramatically, those are the areas that create wealth. So ultimately you have, I, I my suggestion to individuals who are coming into this is that they concentrate their efforts on the cash flow. So what does that mean? That means that there are, within every municipality, there's areas where there's, you can go the cash flow route or you can go on the higher appreciation route. Um, you look at a place like uh, Chicago, for example, you have, you know, you have the north side of Chicago and then you have the south side of Chicago. And if you look at the numbers associated with both of those markets, uh, and that's pretty uh, broad, you'll see what I mean. That one side has more slated toward the cash flow side where you, the arithmetic is very simple to understand and there's money to be made. And then there's opportunity on the appreciation side where you need, or you're going to sacrifice something in terms of the you're going to pay more per door. You're going to pay, you're going to get something more, uh, you're going to buy something at a lower cap rate, but ultimately you're going to, you're going to see much more appreciation and value. Now the last, you asked me a second part of that. Oh, uh, in terms of putting a power team together, like it, um, it's, 
it, it goes from a mortgage brokers to real estate agents so that's in that marketplace, uh, wholesalers, depends on what where your focus is. Uh, ultimately, if it's on the single family side, even on multifamily, you're still dealing with the same sort of types of people that you should create those relationships with. And that is the most difficult and takes to perhaps takes the longest, but it's most the most fruitful in that once you develop these personal relationships with individuals, establish clearly, you know, a win-win situation in those, uh, it's over a period of time, you'll see how much it'll it'll net in terms of your your progress moving forward and developing that real estate investment portfolio. You know, doing doing renovations across so many properties, when when you've looked at your past or historical performance on your multifamily properties, is there a series or stage of renovations that has really um, become your your core philosophy that you said this is something we have to double down on? And on the other side of that, has there been a renovation package that you've you've put in place, you know, across properties and then found out later that, you know, going forward, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. It doesn't help the property, it doesn't help the community, it's not really adding the value that we thought it would be. Of course, uh, we're always constantly learning, even though I've been at going at this for over 30 years, markets change, things that used to be or were, were popular, you know, three years ago aren't as popular now. So we're constantly uh, looking at what our competitors are doing, constantly tweaking and making sure that we're generating, uh, you know, the KPIs and all of our, uh, all of our investments. Um, now to answer your first part of your question with regards to is there's uh, is there a process I, I guess is there a process or are there things uh, that we that I concentrate on in the development of a property once it's required and making sure that we re- meet our projections I uh, heavily focus on the common area improvements more than the individual suites I have found that uh, that ultimately when we're looking to raise prop uh, rental uh, rents that common area improvements, whether it's lobby hallways, those things really add a bigger or higher ROI than individual suites and individual suite renovations can be pretty, can be pretty expensive. So if we were to sort of generalize uh, an apartment that would cost you $10,000 uh, a door, if you take a, a, a fraction of that and contribute it to the hallways, to the elevator, to the lobby, whatever those common areas are, you will see that all of a sudden the class of building or the profile of tenants that the prospective tenants you should be attracting will significantly increase versus the kind of you know the heavy capital improvements that you should be making on the individual suites. Often find oftentimes when I'm dealing with uh, with with you know, new real estate investors in particular who've elevated from the single family home side up to the multifamily space, that that is the, that is the biggest struggle is that they have sort of these dollars, these projections that they've brought to their investors they're the best, and, and, and you've looked them straight in the eye and you've given them this and they've trust you now. They've given you their hard earned dollars to use that money toward this deal you put this deal together, you got all these projections, all these numbers look wonderful. Then all of a sudden you got to got to put boots on the ground. You got to make some difficult decisions. And that's where I find a lot of first time multifamily investors, syndicators are struggling with that, that first nut to crack. Once they get that first property under their belt and they're understanding the processes and systems associated with how to carry the ball forward, meeting those projections, identifying you know, the things that you can do and you can't do. It'd be nice if we had an unlimited budget, right, uh, Jason? And, and we all go in with an idea that we're going to spend, let's say, $5,000 per door, or we're going to spend $300,000 in com- common area improvements, right? But ultimately, when you start look, talking to contractors, and one contractor will tell you one thing, another contractor will tell you another thing, uh, all of a sudden now you're struggling. Now you're in this gray zone. You don't know which direction to go. And, yet, and then the numbers you're getting back, are so convoluted and they're all over the place. One guy will tell you a hundred thousand, another guy will tell you 200,000. And also ultimately you're not, you're not assured of whether any of these guys or girls will actually drive the bus forward to get you to your projections. Yeah. And I, I find that lots of, lots of multifamily syndicators look at, you know, they, they struggle with this one thing to use your own money toward a deal. So another one you're look when you have, Somebody placed their trust in you. They give in their hard-earned money, and now you have that burden on your shoulders that you need to overcome. And it, they're struggling, and that's where I, I've seen my biggest assistance or help of folks in the, being able to guide them through that process. In that, 
because uh, I, I, I'm a general contractor and I've worn a number of different hats, I can immediately go through an estimate or a quote and determine, hey, is this actually going to deliver value or not? And I've done this long enough to know where there's a lot of fat and things that can be cut down and ultimately to be able to hit the numbers associated with what you went in with those projections. Yeah. Um, you know, it really starts with, uh, I've, I've spoken a lot, but you, you hopefully you understand that. No, absolutely. It's a, you're, you're setting a narrative for the building, right? And it's hard to quantify. So if you, it, like we go outside in because ultimately it sets the narrative for the people that live there, right? Because they can't see what you're doing in these units. However, if there's a person, you make this unit fantastic, right? And 10,000 hours of renovation, all interior, but then the, the, the person drives up or a couple drives up, uh, you know, parking lots, alligator cracked, potholes everywhere. You're coming in, you know, the door has a, you know, a broken window pane like that they've already had their mental image of that. So it doesn't matter how nice it is when they get into the apartment building, they've already now discounted the building because of how it looks, right? And so you, we, you have to build from the outside in and it's hard to say, hey, I go replace that parking lot. It's going to help me add an additional hundred dollars of rent to, to, to a, a unit, right? Yes, that's hard to quantify, but overall it, it's, it's the site that sells, right? It doesn't matter what's inside if you can't get them there. Right. And so, uh, absolutely, Jason. Uh, there was a long, long time ago, a beautiful real estate agent, uh, you know, 20 some odd years ago, told me something. She said, Van, you can't sell the steak without the sizzle. You need the sizzle in order to sell the steak. And that's, and that goes right across the board, whether it's a single family home or multifamily. I'm actually going through, uh, I'm helping out uh, a, a new syndicators right now where they are struggling to figure out what it is, you know, they have a limited budget like we all do. And so now where are we going to hit the highest ROI items? And that's one of the things, actually, it's funny that you brought that up, is are we going to now resurface the the, the outside uh, parking uh, lot, uh, you know, the parking spaces versus spending those kind of dollars into the individual suites? And I said, no, 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 you got to spend it there. Why? Because we want to elevate also, we want to be able to go to all of the tenants that are currently living there, knock on their door when their lease is up, and get into a program where we're going to be, you know, we're going to have, we're going to, we're going to bring out those rental increases, and we're going to say, hey, folks, you know, because of this X, Y, Z, we made some improvements here, and it can be superficial, but nevertheless, the tenant, the existing tenants are there looking at this, and then we, unfortunately, because of these investments, we're going to have to raise your rent. And you'd be surprised at how many folks without spending a nickel toward improvements of their individual suites that they will stay, they will sign on, they'll pay the extra, you know, 80, 100, $120 a month in rent. And you haven't spent a nickel in their apartments. In fact, maybe you even get into a position where you strategize, you identify certain low cost items, replace a, to a toilet, uh, maybe a countertop. And then all of a sudden, you know, for that $500 or $1,000 investment you made in the suite, you say, hey, sign a one-year lease where we're going to raise your rent by $150. That's the types of strategies that, you know, I've done this many, many times, that I help individuals with and be able to put together a comprehensive strategy to make sure that they're able to generate and get to those projections a lot quicker over a, a period of time. Yeah, it's huge because you, you take an account, hey, if I spend 6,500, maybe I get that $200 rent bump. But if you can go in there and spend zero, right, it'd be inside the unit and just fix the outside and get $150, the, it's a pretty good ROI on, on infinite, right? It's, so it's amazing, it uh, yeah. Jason, it's amazing what the, uh, when you do those types of uh, how the numbers work. And, and then when you're doing your quarterly uh, reports over to your investors, you're showing them real movement you know, forward in terms of increasing rents at, you know, it, it's amazing. It's a beautiful thing. And that's, especially when you're first time, you know, a syndicator, this is your first deal. Uh, you know, these investors are looking at you through a microscope and you're able to, over the course of a six month, one year period of time, generate, you know, that exceed uh, projections. Then guess what? All, all of these folks, or most of these folks have a couple of other dollars that they're willing to throw at another deal that you're going to put together. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. Well, Van, this has been an incredible talk. Thank you for all your value, all your wisdom from you know 30 plus years of investing, even back to your parents in that first project, just a lesson learned from that. So really appreciate you coming on the show for everyone who's listening, like to learn more about you, your story, what's the best way for them to reach out? Well, I'm on, I'm on social media, so they can look me up on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I have a website, uh, vansturgeon.com, where I, I've got a number of articles that I've written that have been picked up from Yahoo News and places like that. And I've been on a number of podcasts, just like yours, great podcasts where there's tremendous content. And um, 
there's also uh, there's a couple of tools that I have on my actual uh, website, like a free renovation calculator that I recommend folks if they're looking for something that they can use to, to create a sort of a checklist to be able to go through whether it's single family home or multifamily. Also to put a, spit out some numbers because that's another struggle that a lot of new investors have is that they reach out to, they're always reaching out, trying to get information from a general contractor, get a number associated with this renovation and, and, and they're struggling with that. So it's a tool that they can use to put, a, put some processes and systems together so that they can, you know, they can be successful. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. So we'll have that in the show notes, Van. Thank you very much for your time. Super appreciate you and super appreciate everyone who's listening. Thank you for having me. Thank you.